Bien, nous allons commencer. Bonjour, bienvenue à toutes et à tous euh, dans notre salle de presse pour notre rendez-vous quotidien euh, en ligne et en direct sur, sur EBS. Nous sommes aujourd'hui le mardi 20 octobre et nous allons commencer, comme euh, à notre habitude, par quelques annonces. Je commence avec l'agenda de la présidente qui, aujourd'hui, s'entretiendra par vidéoconférence avec le président du Conseil italien, M. Giuseppe Conte, sur les sujets d'actualité et notamment, bien entendu, la situation Covid-19. J'appelle maintenant Balash pour une annonce sur le soutien financier de l'Europe aux pays du Sahel. So today, the European Union, Denmark, Germany, and the United Nations are co-hosting a virtual ministerial roundtable on Africa's Central Sahel region. The event will discuss longer-term perspectives for countries in the region to overcome the spiral of violence and humanitarian crisis they are currently facing. It also aims at mobilizing support for the region, especially as the coronavirus pandemic increases humanitarian needs. The EU will be represented by uh, Commissioner Yanez Lunacic, who is, of course, in charge of crisis management, and he will pledge a total of 43.6 million euro on behalf of the EU to three countries in the Central Sahel region for the rest of 2020. Now, the EU's pledge consists of 23.6 million euro in funding for humanitarian actions in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, and 20 million euro in developing funding, in development funding to address the food crisis afflicting the Central Sahel region in cooperation with the World Food Programme. Now, overall, the EU and its member states have mobilized around 8 billion euro since 2014 to help stabilize the Sahel region. Thank you very much, Balash. Um, pour finir, un point sur la vidéoconférence du jour. Le, le commissaire, uh, Monsieur Janusz Wojciechowski, représente depuis hier la commission au Conseil Agriculture et Pêche qui se déroule au Luxembourg. La réunion d'aujourd'hui fera le point sur la réforme de la politique agricole commune. Le Conseil cherchera à adopter une orientation générale sur les trois règlements prévus dans la nouvelle politique agricole commune. Le commissaire Wojciechowski participera, comme d'habitude, à la conférence de presse qui suivra cette réunion. L'heure précise vous sera communiquée ultérieurement et donc nous vous demandons d'adresser vos éventuelles questions sur la politique agricole commune euh, à cette conférence de presse. Voilà, et avec ceci, nous sommes prêts à passer à vos questions. Et je vois que Athanasios a levé la main. Athanasios, you have the floor. Merci, bonjour. Um, I have an administrative question, because I'm reading a very interesting article this morning on Politico about senior uh, officials and posts that are not filled and... Uh, an alleged uh, bottleneck at the top floor of the Berlimont. Uh, it seems that uh, the president and uh, her chief of staff wants to control also lower senior uh, posts, like those of directors. First of all, my question is, is that correct? Is that happening? Are they uh, reviewing one by one the applications of the directors? And uh, if not, why uh, is there such a a backlog in the uh, in the situation and in, in the process of those applications. Why are the there are so many posts unfilled? I know for a fact that there is a post in the DG Mir, the one for the director for Southern Neighborhood Policy, uh, that's unfilled for a year now. So how how does this play out? And uh, I maybe have a follow up on this, but please please tell me. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I will call Balash up to the podium. I love the flag, by the way, in the background uh, on your video screen. Um, Balash, can you yes. give us some elements on this? Without my mask, if I may. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for calling me back on the podium. So um, you invoke quite a few questions. Let, let me take a look at the, the facts. Uh, so if we talk about vacancy rates to begin with, what we see is that the rate is more or less stable over the past three years. In fact, from 2018 until uh, October 2020, if you look at the rate of fluctuation, it's always around 
uh, between one and three uh, percentage points. So they are very, very limited. Now, if you look at the situation now, so in October uh, 2020, it is in fact largely comparable to the state of play um, in November 2019. And of course, by the end of the year, we are expecting to make further progress in this regard. Now, let's uh, take a look at appointments. Um, the share of appointments at the moment um, is already higher than in the previous uh, two years, in fact. So with the present number of appointments in the pipeline, we expect that the final percentage in 2020 will be, in fact, significantly higher um, by, than by the end of the last mandate. So what I can tell you overall is that the track record is pretty good. Um, um, the beginning of the mandate on top of that um, always sees uh, some senior staff uh, uh, leaving uh, their position to join cabinets, for example, which of course uh, a particular circumstance that has to be taken into account because it increases the number of uh, vacant uh, positions. On top of that, what I need to add is that we have had the coronavirus, but despite that, despite the additional workload and strain it brings about, we have managed to ensure that the senior appointment procedures uh, uh, have continued and proceeded as normal. And the final remark from my side would be that um, this commission, of course, takes extremely seriously as well um, gender equality considerations, which play an important role in the selection of senior managers as well. Thank you, uh, Balash. I believe part of your question uh, related to whether there was uh, more control from uh, the president's cabinet on senior appointments than before, not at all. I mean, uh, you, you say, are they taking an interest in the appointment of directors? Well, the formal procedure of appointment of directors, who, by the way, are senior managers in, in the commission, um, is something that has always involved the president's cabinet, along with the secretariat general and other senior managers in the, in the commission, through what you call the uh, uh, consultative committee on, um, on appointments. Uh, so, and it is a decision which is taken by the college, so necessarily uh, these decisions, of course, are on the radar screen of, uh, of the president's cabinet as they are on the radar screen of the senior management of the human resources department. The only thing that has, uh, that has changed is the fact that this commission takes gender balance extremely seriously, and you may have noticed that um, a, a new small group of people was put together um, uh, that includes the head of cabinet, but not only, um, Balash can give you the list, it also includes the secretary general and some other people, in order to ensure that what comes out of the pre-selection panels in the directorates general, uh, in terms of candidates for the final stages of the appointment procedure, um, includes um, a, a balanced representation, a pr sufficient proportion of, um, of women, and therefore, uh, and therefore, this is the only added and very valuable step that has been added in order to ensure that the House learns the culture of making sure that uh, sufficient candidates come out from the ranks and apply for the jobs uh, of senior manager, be they men or, um, or women. So overall, I think that, frankly, the facts um, uh, bear out that there is an effective policy, including on on gender balancing of, um, of senior appointments and that it has been implemented uh, very thoroughly as Balash has demonstrated to you. But I believe you had a follow-up question, Athanasios. So what you're telling me is that there is no politicization of the appointment of directors anyhow in this process and there is no particular interest or scrutiny from those new individuals who are scrutinizing the applications on the essence of the applications of directors. Because you always knew that director general and deputy director general level was always handled by the, uh, uh, the uh, his chief of staff uh, back in the day and always were semi-political positions. But director level was largely ignored by the 13th floor. So, what you have just described means that there is no politicization of this thing right now as a new element, but only uh, uh, a, an attempt to introduce gender balance. Am I right on that, or have I misunderstood what you told me? Thanks. You're definitely right on the fact that there is uh, no, uh, I don't know what you call political interference. As I said, uh, directors are appointed by the college. 
Okay, and therefore these decisions by the college are always uh, um, are always taken in agreement with the commissioner in charge. That's very important. The commissioner in charge of human resources, and then uh, the whole college. But after a process that involves, uh, in particular, the cabinet of the president in the um, in the context of the um, committee committee on consult uh, the consultative committee. Sorry. On, um, on appointments, and this has always concerned directors. Uh, having gone through it uh, myself uh, some years ago, I can tell you that, of course, there is always uh, an involvement of the highest levels of the house in appointing uh, senior managers, which start uh, at the level of, um, of director and um, uh, senior advisors, all right? So there's nothing absolutely new. What I've said is that we do have um, an added scrutiny that involves the president of the cabinet, the secretary general, uh, the director general of, um, uh, sorry, the head of cabinet of the um, of the um, of the commissioner in charge of uh, of human resources and DG uh, human resources, on the fact that what comes out of uh, the pre-selection panels is sufficiently representative of the wide talent pool that we have in the institution, both um, in terms of men and women. And I think that that's a good thing. And despite this uh, added scrutiny, uh, the number of uh, senior appointments that has been made uh, since this commission has taken office is actually higher than the number of appointments which was made in the last year of the previous commission. And there will be certainly more appointments to come before the end of the year. So for us, there is, uh, there is really no story there um, at all. Okay, thank you very much. I see a huge number of questions uh, for us today, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and I think also reflects the fact that we haven't had an online briefing for a short while. So I think we will stop on this uh, issue and uh, move on to uh, the next person having um, raised her hand. Um, uh, Odile, please. Oui, bonjour. Euh, moi, j'ai deux questions. Euh, suite à l'attentat euh, euh, terroriste islamique euh, à Conflans-Saint-Honorine euh, qui a décapité un professeur, je voudrais savoir si euh, vous allez euh, convoquer les GAFA et, les, et, et, et avoir une action pour essayer de stopper euh, les, les propos de radicalisation sur euh, tous ces sites euh, de, de réseaux sociaux qui apparemment ont joué, dans cette, ont joué un rôle euh, malheureusement important dans la radicalisation de, de, de ce jeune. Et, et, et puisque ça concerne la France, mais ça concerne aussi tout l'ensemble de l'Union européenne, me semble-t-il. Et ma deuxième préoccupation, euh, suite à cette, euh, ce triste événement, euh, ne pensez-vous pas que cela va euh, aussi affecter l'adhésion des États membres euh, concernant le Immigration Pact? Euh, parce que déjà, de, de nombreuses voix s'élèvent en France en disant, en tout cas, il ne faut pas que le gouvernement français signe ce, euh, ce Immigration Pact. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Odile, pour ta question. Avant euh, d'appeler Johannes au, au podium, euh, permets-moi de réitérer que nous condamnons avec la plus grande euh, fermeté euh, cet assassinat, cet acte euh, terroriste qui s'est déroulé à conflans sainte honorine euh, vendredi, vendredi dernier. Euh, il est évident que euh, de, de tels actes de violence sont absolument inacceptables, euh, où que ce soit euh, dans le monde euh, et, euh, et en Europe, bien entendu. Comme l'a dit la présidente, Madame von der Leyen, nous adressons nos condoléances euh, à sa famille et aux Français en général, et nous avons une pensée particulière pour, euh, pour les enseignants, euh, en France, en Europe et en fait partout dans le, partout dans le monde, puisque sans eux, il est clair qu'il n'y aurait ni citoyen ni démocratie euh, possible. Maintenant, en ce qui concerne euh, ta question particulière sur les, euh, sur les GAFA, je vais demander, et les actions que la Commission pourrait entreprendre là-dessus, ou à des gens entrepris, je vais demander à Johannes de te répondre. Merci beaucoup, Eric.
donc voilà, la question concerne bien sûr beaucoup de volets de notre travail avec les plateformes en ligne. Euh, ça concerne les, les contenus terroristes, par exemple, où Adabé sera peut-être mieux placé d'ajouter quelques mots, mais je, je commencerai peut-être à rappeler qu'on a, par exemple, le code de conduite contre la haine en ligne en vigueur, qui, euh, euh, qui compte les grandes plateformes euh, parmi les, les signataires et qui a achevé des, des bons résultats euh, en ce qui concerne le l'enlèvement des, des contenus euh, haineux, donc euh, là, autour de 90%, plus que 90% des contenus sont euh, enlevés dans, dans 20, 20, 24 heures après notification. Euh, après, on travaille bien sûr étroitement avec les États membres Europol et d'autres euh, euh, acteurs euh, dans, dans le domaine, donc c'est quelque chose qu'on prend très au sérieux. Euh, comme vous le savez, bien sûr, sans doute, il y aura euh, très prochainement notre proposition sur, euh, euh, sur euh, donc ça s'appelle en anglais, Digital Sur euh, Services Act, donc euh, euh, la loi euh, adressant les services en ligne. Euh, ça, ce n'est pas contre le terrorisme en ligne, ça c'est important à souligner, mais ça, ça, met quand même, euh, donc ça a quand même pour but euh, d'établir des standards en ce qui concerne les, les contenus illégaux en ligne. Donc, ça concerne la haine en ligne, le terrorisme, en, euh, contenu terroriste euh, en ligne et d'autres. Donc, ça, ça voilà euh, ce que, que je veux dire à ce stade. Mais j'inviterai je, je, peut-être aussi, tu permets, à Dabert de nous, nous en dire davantage sur les euh, contenus terroristes. Merci. Je passe la parole à Dalbert pour la deuxième partie de ta question concernant la politique migra migratoire. Pardon. À Dalbert. Merci. Euh, Peut-être juste pour, euh, pour répondre d'abord à, à l'encouragement de Johannes de, de dire quelques mots sur le contenu terroriste en ligne. Euh, Peut-être deux choses. Premièrement, il existe un protocole de crise de l'Union européenne qui est, euh, qui est une initiative qui euh, concerne les États membres, Europol et euh, les, euh, les entreprises qui fournissent des, ou, ou des pla les plateformes Internet. Et ce protocole de crise a été activé par les autorités françaises le 16 octobre. Euh, les autorités ont demandé à Europol d'identifier euh, et euh, assister à l'enlèvement du, du contenu qui était lié à cette, à cette attaque, euh, en particulier les images de la victime. Donc Europol a, a, a fait exactement ceci. Le protocole est, était est resté activé jusqu'au jusqu 18 octobre et euh, 65 instances de, de ce contenu ont été détectées euh, sur neuf plateformes et donc euh, les, euh, les actions ont été entreprises pour euh, euh, empêcher sa propagation. Euh, par rapport à, au contenu terroriste en ligne euh, plus généralement, euh, je peux rappeler que la Commission a proposé en 2018, en septembre 2018, euh, un règlement concernant justement le, le, le contenu terroriste en ligne avec pour objectif de euh, s'assurer que ce contenu peut être euh, enlevé dans l'heure euh, les négociations sont en cours entre les co-législateurs sur, euh, sur ce règlement. Euh, de notre point de vue, il est nécessaire d'avancer sur ce règlement euh, de manière très urgente et euh, nous soutenons les co-législateurs dans, euh, dans ce travail de manière très active. Et par ailleurs, euh, en principe, un, un trilogue est prévu euh, pour, pour la semaine prochaine. Donc, euh, ce, ce travail est en cours. Euh, et enfin, sur, euh, sur ta question concernant le, le pacte pour la migration et l'asile, euh, je ne sais pas s'il si, euh, si y a lieu de, de faire un commentaire particulier et faire euh, des liens spécifiques entre la, la politique migratoire dans son ensemble et, 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 cet acte, euh, et cet acte terroriste, cet acte criminel. Euh, je, je, nous, nous continuons à travailler avec les États membres sur euh, une politique migratoire qui soit euh, à la fois durable euh, et juste euh, pour, euh, pour les États membres comme pour les, comme pour les migrants. Et euh, euh, nous, ne, le, ce, ce, travail, ce travail continue euh, euh, de manière aussi très intense. Merci beaucoup, Adalbert et Johannes. Euh, je voudrais savoir s'il y a d'autres questions sur ce sujet. Please only keep your hand raised um, if you have a question on, uh, on these issues for the moment. We will come back to other issues afterwards. So I see three, two hands raised on this issue. And first is Nima. 
Nima, you have a question on this issue. Please press speak. Hi, uh, hello. Oui, bonjour. bonjour. Uh, no, I don't have a question. I did. I raise hand. Uh, I have a question about Iran. Actually, it's not. Uh, I didn't raise hand. I didn't. I raised hand before. Actually. Yes, exactly. But you need to unraise it um, so that we can focus on the issue. We'll come back to that uh, later. So, George, you seem to have a question on this um, on this issue. George Kakouris. No mic. Please press speak, if you can. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, the question the question I had raised the hand at the beginning is for a different issue. It's on the infringement procedures. You don't mind? Uh, I wanted to see first whether there were other other questions on this. Okay, I do not, um, I do not see um, any, um, and I will therefore open the floor to other, uh, other issues, and I give the floor to Tomasz Bielecki. Tomasz. Tomasz, you have the floor. Gazeta Wyborcza and Deutsche Welle. I have a question on, on Poland and rule of law and the growing risk of the paralysis of, of, the, of the Ombudsman institution in Poland. The, the, the current Ombudsman terms of, of, terms of office has expired. The successor hasn't been elected. Uh, the ruling party is uh, apparently trying uh, to, to annul uh, provisions uh, allowing the, the, the current or outgoing ombudsman to, 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 to perform his duties until the new, new, new one assumes his uh, position. So the question is uh, if the European Commission is following the issue, if it raised it in its contact with the Polish authorities, is, it go, is the Commission going to, to raise the issue in, in the context of the Article 7 uh, procedure or in any, any other way? Thank you. Thank you, Tomasz. So I pass the floor to Christian on this uh, rule of law issue. Yes, thank you, Eric. Uh, hi, Tomasz. Um, the European Commission is following closely the developments uh, relating to the Polish Ombudsman. We take uh, note of the concerns expressed uh, by several um, international organizations, including uh, the OEC, Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, um, and uh, the Venice Commission. Uh, as set out in the 2020 Rule of Law Report, the institution of the Ombudsman in Poland plays an important role in defending the rule of law and fundamental rights. It also plays a key role in uh, promoting and protecting equal treatment of people uh, living in Poland in its role of designated quality body under EU law. It is therefore of uh, paramount importance to ensure that this institution, which defends citizens' rights, remains independent, that its activity is not hindered, and that its effective operation is preserved, especially in times of crisis such as the pandemic. Thank you very much. Are there other questions on this particular case? Please keep your hand raised only if it is on this. I know for a fact that Nima, you haven't raised your hand on, uh, on this. Um, or on other rule of law issues, in which case I give the floor to Georges, who had asked for the floor before. So George. You're back on for other rule of law issues. Okay, I'm assuming this is for rule of law. Um, uh, it's on the it's on the question of uh, the uh, infringement procedures against Cyprus and Malta, specifically on Cyprus. We need some clarifications. It has announced they will cancel the program. That could mean that soon the government in Cyprus could say that it is no longer in breach of EU law, or if it doesn't cancel or introduce a new problematic program, uh, then we can have a lot of additional shady dealings uh, be done by the time the infringement procedures reaches the conclusion. So the question is, do these procedures cover retroactively the cases already given, uh, or when uh, passports were already given, or the obligation of the government to remove citizenship from uh, questionable applicants that received it uh, when the regulations allowed it? 
Thank you. Thank you. Qu question for Christian indeed. Yes. Um, today, uh, as you have seen, the European Commission is uh, launching infringement procedures uh, against Cyprus and Malta by issuing letters of uh, formal notice regarding their investor citizenship schemes, also referred to as uh, golden passports. The Commission considers that the granting of citizenship for predetermined payments or investments without any genuine link with the member states concerned undermines the essence of EU citizenship. Cypriot and uh, Maltese governments have two months to reply to the letters of formal notice. If the replies are not satisfactory, the Commission may issue a reasoned opinion on this matter. Um, more concretely on um, your question regarding um, the uh, end, ending or possible announced ending of uh, the program in Cyprus, um, we are aware of such uh, announcements, of course. However, uh, the schemes uh, remain in place for the time being uh, in both member states concerned and could be replaced uh, by similar investment schemes. Uh, Malta has, in fact, uh, informed the Commission that it envisages a prolongation of citizenship for investment. And while Cyprus has very recently announced it will end its current scheme as of uh, 1st of November, it will continue to process uh, pending applications. Um, we understand there are also uh, already calls regarding the introduction of a new scheme. So such schemes are in violation of EU law. And this is why we are launching the infringements today. Thank you very much. We will continue on the issue of uh, rule of law. I see lots of hands raised. Please only keep your hand if it is uh, a question for Christian on the rule of law. Nima, I understand your question is on Iran. So I'm uh, not giving you the floor for the moment. We'll come to external affairs at a later point in time. Thank you. Catherine, you have a question on rule of law. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, yes, Eric, it is on the rule of law. The European People's Party yesterday uh, issued a, a, a press release, and they are calling for uh, uh, an immediate, for immediate and urgent action over the deterioration of rule of law in Poland, in particular particular the independence of the judiciary and Christian you said that you are following this closely um, but what they want is um, immediate and urgent action so uh, do you think that you will be moving from following this closely to immediate and urgent action and also uh, the Hungarian Parliament has uh, appointed uh, a new president of its Supreme Court Zolt Andres Varga uh, despite the fact that the overwhelming uh, majority of uh, the, their, their judicial, their National Judicial Council considers this candidate to be unqualified, is this something that the Commission will look into? Yes, thank you, Catherine. Allow me first uh, to, to come back to George's once more because I actually I just realized that um, I have not replied to one angle of the questions, which is about the, the re retroactivity. Um, so, um, we understand that both uh, Cyprus and Malta are car currently carrying out a screening process uh, of the already successful applications. This is something that the Commission um, encourages and has been encouraging for a while. Um, we have launched the infringement procedure today, so we will not uh, speculate on its uh, possible outcome uh, or implications in the, in, in, and the possible next steps that we might see. What is important is that um, going forward, no member state is operating schemes that essentially result in selling uh, of EU citizenship. As uh, President von der Leyen had said, uh, European values are not for sale. Um, on individual cases, um, whether a person uh, stripped, uh, can be stripped of the nationality, it has already been granted after such a screening. This is as always for the competent authorities uh, to assess with uh, regard to relevant national and EU law and under the control of independent courts. Um, so to come back to, to Catherine, to come back to Catherine uh, on um, 
Poland first. I mean, I've just uh, given you our position regarding um, the latest developments regarding the Ombuds uh, person, which I think is very clear. Uh, we will, of course, continue to follow uh, these developments closely, um, but I'm not going to go now into, into uh, any pos possible uh, steps that we might take. You know, there is an ongoing uh, Article 7 procedure in which the Commission always stands ready uh, to support uh, the Council on all the relevant issues in the, in the discussions and in the process that is um, on, in, in course. And uh, otherwise, we also have um, just launched our new uh, rule of law mechanism, how we call it, which, um, of which the main part is our rule of law report, our annual rule of law report. And there will, of course, now in the, in, in the Council uh, follow discussions uh, on all the relevant uh, subjects uh, of all member states. So um, there is an ongoing process in place and the Commission is active, very active on these rule of law matters. Um, on your question on Hungary, I can tell you the following. Um, we are aware of the recent developments regarding the Hungarian Supreme Court, the Curia, including the appointment uh, of a new president uh, following a negative opinion by the National Judicial Council. Let me point to the latest rule of law report, which noted the Commission's concerns on developments related to the Supreme Court, in particular regarding the new rules on appointments, which have uh, lowered the eligibility criteria for Supreme Court members, including its president, and increased the role of parliament and the discretion of the president of the Republic on such appointments. The late latest developments only confirm the concerns. The Commission in its rule of law report underlined the importance of reducing the influence of the legislative or executive power over uh, the judiciary in order to strengthen judicial independence. We will continue to follow developments closely. Thank you. I think that, David, your question is on the same issue, so go ahead. Yes, thank you. Apart, uh, David Carretta Radio Radicale, uh, Christian, apart from uh, uh, expressing your uh, concerns and following the situation, what are you going to do? I mean, uh, the statement of the National Judicial Council in Hungary, it's quite clear. Uh, they, are, they have said that uh, um, uh, this is a, a clear violation of the independence of justice. So you, you have uh, asked for uh, um, interim measure for Poland. Are you going to do the same with uh, uh, Hungary? Or Viktor Orban is different. Thank you. David, if I can just say, I think that Christian was very clear in saying that uh, we are following the situation and that uh, we would announce uh, any possible steps when, when we get there, but we, we are not going to discuss uh, now. Uh, here in the press room, um, uh, possible uh, possible steps uh, or measures that could be taken. You know, you know how this works. Uh, we analyze situations and then we come forward with proposals uh, at a given point in time. And this is when we this is when we communicate um, on them. I know uh, I know that uh, we would all wish that it were different, but this is how this is how the process uh, process works. Do we have other rule of law questions for us today? I still see quite a few hands raised. We stick to the issue of uh, rule of law. Griselda, you have your hand raised. Maintenant. Merci beaucoup, Eric. J'avais un problème avec le micro. J'allume pas la caméra, excusez-moi. Uh, ma question, c'est sur la réforme judiciaire en Espagne. Moi, j'aimerais savoir si la déclaration que vous avez faite jeudi dernier équivaut à l'ouverture d'une procédure formelle. Euh, oui ou non, je ne sais pas. Est-ce que vous avez eu des contacts avec le gouvernement espagnol, des contacts directs 
parce que j'ai dit, et vendredi, le gouvernement n'était pas conscient de, de, des raisons qui justifiaient euh, la note. Et puis, euh, j'aimerais aussi savoir, vous avez reçu beaucoup de plaintes de partis à l'opposition en Espagne écrites contre cette réforme et contre d'autres attitudes ou relations entre des membres du gouvernement espagnol et le système judiciaire. Est-ce que vous pourriez nous dire qu'est-ce que vous pensiez en faire de toutes ces plaintes que vous avez reçues Merci beaucoup. Merci. Christiane. Alors, um, Christelle, on était en contact euh, sur ce sujet euh, la semaine dernière. Il n'y avait pas beaucoup de, de changements euh, depuis ce, ce, ces derniers jours. Euh, nous avons fait clair notre position concernant, euh, la, euh, concernant cette proposition et nous, et nous suivons de près. Euh, les développements. Euh, au, concernant les contacts, euh, en tant que je sache, il n'y avait pas de contact euh, euh, particulier avec euh, le gouvernement à, à ce stade, euh, mais bien sûr, la, la Commission est toujours en contact euh, avec nos interlocuteurs. Euh, il y avait une... Un, un, euh, échange de, de, de lettres ou une lettre en fait euh, de, de la partie Popo, Populado euh, de M. Casado euh, au conseil Reinders euh, il y a aussi euh, un euh, euh, entretien avec, entre euh, les deux alors euh, et concernant le plainte euh, c'est encore euh, le même que je, je t'avais dit euh, je ne suis pas en liste ex, euh, exhaustive euh, avec moi. Euh, je, je peux vérifier euh, c'est ce qui s'est passé euh, concernant les, les, euh, pendant les derniers jours. Merci. Donc nous reviendrons vers toi, Griselda, sur la, sur la question de la, de la liste euh, exacte. Je vois que tu as un follow-up, Griselda. Merci beaucoup. C'est que je n'ai pas bien compris quand, quand tu dis que vous avez, nous avons été en contact, tu veux dire avec moi ou tu veux dire avec le gouvernement Excuse-moi. Ma, ma, ma première question était, est-ce que vous avez eu déjà, depuis jeudi, des contacts directs avec le gouvernement euh, Merci. Comme, hein. comme j'arrive de, de dire que celle d'autant que c'est chasse, il, il n'y avait pas eu de euh, euh, prise de contact euh, de la part de le, du gouvernement. Euh, euh, oui. Donc, si, si, je peux, si je peux avoir la parole, donc il n'y a pas eu de contact spécifique de la Commission depuis notre déclaration avec le gouvernement euh, espagnol sur ce, euh, sur ce sujet. Voilà. Très bien. Griselda, ça répond à ta question, je crois. Euh, je vais... Euh, tu as encore un follow-up, mais s'il te plaît, il y a beaucoup de questions, donc... Brièvement. Mais merci, je serai très courte. Pourquoi pas Étant donné que la question vous inquiète jusqu'au point de faire une déclaration, pourquoi vous n'avez pas eu encore, ou vous n'avez pas eu du tout, des contacts avec le gouvernement espagnol Merci beaucoup. Mais enfin, Griselda, euh, d'abord, nous avons fait une déclaration. Donc déjà, en soi, c'est déjà, euh, déjà quelque chose euh, d'important qui signale euh, notre intérêt pour la question. Ensuite, euh, il y a... Euh, il y a à la Commission énormément d'activités qui sont en cours à n'importe quel, quel moment. Nous sommes constamment en, en contact avec le gouvernement espagnol sur différents, sur différents sujets. Nous avons sorti un rapport sur l'état de droit, y compris euh, sur la situation en, en Espagne. Et donc les, les choses suivront, suivront leur cours. Voilà, nous restons sur les questions état de droit. Je vois encore pas mal de mains euh, levées. So on rule of law questions, please only keep your hand raised if it is on this. Et je vois que Alain a une question. Vous entendez Nous t'entendons Alain. Ouais. C'est bien état de droit. Bonjour pas Eric. Oui, oui, oui c'est sur euh, les passeports dorés. Je voudrais savoir si vous avez des, euh, des statistiques euh, récentes. Combien de passeports ont été, euh, ont été délivrés de la sorte euh, à Malte et à Chypre Et puis, je voudrais savoir, euh, si je comprends bien, 
le gouvernement euh, chypriote au moins, et je crois maltais, se sont engagés à une abrogation euh, graduelle. Est-ce que cela vous satisfait Quelle abrogation graduelle et à quelle échéance Est-ce que vous êtes donc d'accord avec ça ou est-ce que vous ne voulez pas juste que ça s'arrête rapidement Parce que finalement, il n'y a pas de raison qu'on continue à, 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 à poursuivre ce type de, ce type de, de délivrance de, de passeport. Merci. Question. Oui, bonjour. Euh... Je pense que j'ai déjà euh, répondu à ta, ta première question euh, concernant les changements de, ou les, les, les annonces de, de, changer, euh, de changer les règles. Alors, euh, pour le moment, euh, le système continue et euh, il y a aussi des annoncements de, 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 de le prolonger. Euh, et pour ça, euh, après un long processus euh, aussi de dialogue entre la Commission et les États membres, euh, on a décidé euh, de, de, de commencer ces procédures d'infraction aujourd'hui. Euh, concernant euh, les statistiques, alors je, je dirais que c'est premièrement une question pour euh, les États membres euh, concernés. Euh, mais tu peux aussi euh, consulter euh, notre rapport concernant euh, Citizenship euh, for Investment euh, que, la commission a, euh, que la Commission a publié en janvier 2019. Voilà, donc Alain, nous ne nous satisfaisons pas d'annonces. Euh, C'est pourquoi nous avons malgré tout, euh, malgré les annonces qui ont pu être faites, euh, lancer euh, cette procédure d'infraction. Let us stay on the issue of rule of law and I give the floor to Francesco. Uh, Alain, tu as un follow-up. Sorry, Francesco, we'll come back to you. Mais euh, encore, je vais dire quelque chose que je crois que j'ai déjà dit. Je suis journaliste euh, euh, radio. Euh, je passe des sons, notamment de gens. Et si je repose la question, c'est parce que j'ai besoin de sons en français qui est la langue de mes auditeurs. Donc je repose la question. Je voudrais avoir une réponse claire en français sur ces deux questions et ne pas me renvoyer à des rapports, si vous voulez bien, parce que ça fait, je pense, partie de, du travail euh, ici en, en tribune et dans cet échange. Euh, Est-ce que vous vous satisfaisez d'une abrogation graduelle telle que euh, 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 promise ou engagée euh, par les deux pays en question Et combien de passeports à ce jour ont été délivrés à Chypre et à Malte Une réponse en français, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Alain, je t'ai répondu très clairement en français sur ta première question. Je t'ai dit que nous ne nous satisfaisons pas d'annonces et que nous avions donc lancé les procédures d'infraction. Je ne vois pas ce que nous pouvons répondre de plus Clairement. Et sur ta deuxième question, je suis désolé, euh, tu poses une question, nous décidons de ce que nous souhaitons répondre. Et euh, si euh, le porte-parole en charge te dit que ces chiffres sont disponibles dans un rapport euh, et qu'il te demande de le consulter, c'est la réponse qui est, qui, est, euh, qui est la nôtre aujourd'hui sur le, sur le podium. Elle peut ne pas te satisfaire et tu peux nous critiquer pour cela, j'en suis absolument conscient. Euh, mais c'est la réponse que nous souhaitons donner aujourd'hui ici sur le podium et ça n'a rien à voir avec une question ni de français ni de préparation. Merci beaucoup. Francesco, we come back to you. Yes, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I have, uh, I would need a clarification and then I would ask a question after the clarification is, if possible. Uh, you are saying that uh, Uh, the infringement uh, against Malta and Cyprus is based on the fact that, uh, okay, they, they of course uh, offer uh, passports uh, uh, in exchange for an investment, but also mostly because there is no genuine link uh, uh, between the investor and the country. Given that uh, obviously these investors are not, uh, do, do not have relatives on the islands, I assume that the lack of genuine uh, a link to the country means that uh, uh, they do not spend uh, any meaningful time on those islands. That's the reason why you are saying that they don't have genuine links. That's because the two schemes do not require investors to spend any meaningful time period in, uh, on, uh, in their countries. Is that correct? Christian. Hi, Francesco. Yes, that is in that is in essence correct. Uh, it is of course related uh, to 
to residence requirements, which also need to be um, enforced uh, in, in practice. So the Commission considers that the granting by these member states of the nationality and thereby EU citizenship in exchange for a predetermined payment or investment and without a genuine link with the member state concerned is not compatible uh, with the principle of sincere cooperation enshrined in Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on European Union. This also undermines the integrity of the status of EU citizenship provided for in Article 20 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Thank you. I think you had a follow-up or a comment. Francesco, go ahead. No? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Now I have the question. Thanks. Uh, given that this is clear now, um, uh, uh, my question is uh, why then uh, you are not opening any infringement procedures against uh, countries that have uh, uh, that uh, sell their uh, they sell visa golden visa schemes uh, and do not require any uh, uh, meaningful period in the country in your report uh, uh, from last year you you Portugal Greece and Bulgaria are those countries but also, in the past, we have had several other countries, including, for instance, Latvia, which was one of the pioneers of this, uh, for instance, when D Dombrovskis was prime minister, by the way, and that uh, 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 with, with implications that are still uh, there, given that many of those people still uh, have this... Uh, uh, visas. So why do you do not open infringements also uh, against uh, uh, countries uh, uh, for their uh, uh, golden visa schemes, given that in your own report you say that risks of money laundering and uh, uh, facilitation of, uh, of uh, uh, organized crime are exactly the same uh, for golden visa and uh, and uh, uh, passport uh, uh, and golden passport schemes. Thanks. Christian. Yes, Francesco. Well, um, of course, uh, let's, let's say as a baseline, of course, uh, I can in, in general not, not uh, comment on why we would not launch an infringement on a certain issue. That's obviously at the discretion of the, of the Commission. Um, but, and, and you're right that uh, the residence schemes were also covered by the report in January 2019, and uh, we also saw uh, some, had some concerns about those. Uh, nevertheless, let me also remind that, that of course, we are talking um, legally uh, about, about different, different issues. Uh, we are not talking about uh, EU citizenship in the end, but we are talking about uh, certain um, residency uh, rights that, that can be granted uh, by member states and then are also, uh, first of all, um, relevant uh, in the first place only for the respective uh, member state and not for the whole of the EU. Um, but I wouldn't go now uh, much more into detail on this, also given this that uh, residence is actually rather covered by uh, Adalbert on, as it's an it's a issue of, of home affairs. Thank you. So we stay on the issue of um, rule of law for the moment. I still see some hands raised. Momshil, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, as I see from the information published uh, by the European Commission, According to this information, the Commission is also writing again to Bulgaria to highlight its concerns regarding an investor citizenship scheme operated by that member state. So could you explain what's the difference between the situation in Malta, in Malta and Cyprus by, uh, uh, by one side and in Bulgaria in another? And if Bulgaria has, what is the progress made in Bulgaria from the previous, uh, from the previous letter? Thank you very much, Christian, who has a full day today. Yes, I want to. Um, yes, indeed, the Commission is uh, sending today um, also a political letter to the Bulgarian authorities about the scheme operated by Bulgaria. Um, the letter is uh, urging the Bulgarian authorities to phase out 
uh, their citizenship scheme in the context of the ongoing legislative procedure currently in Bulgaria. Uh, we are also asking the Bulgarian authorities to provide the Commission with clear information uh, about the scheme. Bulgaria has uh, one month to reply and um, the Commission will not hesitate to take the appropriate measures, also in this case, uh, should our concerns not be addressed sufficiently. Momshi, I see you have a follow-up. Go ahead. Mm, okay, but uh, I asked also uh, uh, what is, um, has Bulgaria made uh, any progress since the previous letter of the European Commission? And if, if so, what, uh, uh, in, in what consti this progress consists? Look, uh, as, I, as I think I repeated a few times already, it's uh, always at the discretion of the Commission to decide at which stage um, to go to uh, the stage of a formal infringement procedure. Also in the case of Malta and Cyprus, there was a long uh, s uh, story ongoing before that, several exchanges of letters, political contacts. Um, we had the report uh, in January 2019 um, and um, so the decision made at this stage, given, uh, given the, all the information that was collected uh, and given the exchanges so far and the situation in the respective member states is the one that you see today. So for Bulgaria, uh, there is now this letter that has been sent, a short deadline of one month to come back to the Commission on this and then let's see what happens after that. Thank you very much, Christian. I do not see any further hand raised on the issue of a rule of law. So I open the floor to um, other issues um, now and um, I go to Fabio. Go ahead, Fabio. Go ahead, Fabio. Hi, good morning. Could you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Okay. Well, so. Uh, my question is about the uh, Italian budget law uh, because a few days ago the Italian government uh, approved the Italian budget law for the 2021. So uh, could you confirm that uh, you received the Italian budget uh, law for 2021? And uh, I was wondering, when are you going to reply? Thanks. Thank you, Fabio. This is a question for Marta. Indeed, thank you very much, Fabio, for your question. Um, so indeed, I can confirm that we have received uh, the draft budgetary plan of Italy. Um, we are actually publishing all the budgetary plans uh, as soon as we receive them on our website, so they can be freely consulted by, by yourself and, and colleagues. Uh, now, as regarding next steps, um, we are in the process of, of uh, assessing the draft budgetary plans as part of the European semester process, as, as usual, a uh, process which happens each year. Uh, perhaps to give you a little bit of, of context in, in the way we will be assessing the draft budgetary plans this year, um, on the 19th of September, the Commission has sent letters to all member states, including Italy, of course, uh, to provide additional guidance as regards the preparation of their draft budgetary plans. Uh, the Commission in those letters confirmed uh, the need for the fiscal policy to remain uh, supportive uh, for the recovery in 2021. Um, and therefore, the Commission's assessment of the draft budgetary plans this year will take into account the activation of the so-called ge general escape clause uh, and the absence of uh, specific quantitative uh, fiscal recommendations. And in particular, the Commission's assessment will be based um, on the country-specific recommendations which were issued by the Council in July, uh, focusing on the measures taken and planned uh, to combat uh, the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and to support the recovery. And of course, you can expect um, a Commission opinion on the Italian plan, like uh, also on the others, um, to be issued by the end of uh, November. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Um, so now we've opened the chapter on the economy. I would like you to keep your hand raised only if you have a question for uh, Marta on the Italian budget uh, or on related economic issues, since I know we have many questions today. Um, 
James, I have a hard time believing that you have a question on, uh, on the Italian budget. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, Lorenzo, is it on this issue? Go ahead. Yes, uh, if you can hear me, yeah? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, good. Okay, it, it is not on the budget, but it is on, on uh, this, uh, these issues. And, uh, I, I would like to know, uh, there was this uh, announcement by the Commission that all member states uh, had to present an informal version of their uh, national plans for recovery and resilience for the recovery fund for the RRF uh, by the 15th of October and I know that uh, many member states have done it uh, my question is what kind of request uh, was uh, this by the, the Commission it, it, um, the plan had to be a formal plan an informal plan but with a text I mean with a paper something or just the beginning of an informal dialogue with the Commission in order to have uh, an exchange and guidance on the future uh, formal uh, national plans. And how many member states have presented uh, papers, documents, and how many are in uh, a, a informal dialogue without having presented any paper? Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, a question for Marta. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, so indeed, when we have issued our guidance a few weeks ago uh, regarding the preparation of the recovery and resilience plans, we have uh, also encouraged um, all member states to um, enter into a form informal dialogue with, with the Commission in order to prepare the recovery and resilience plans. We have indeed indicated the 15th of October as an indicative date uh, when member states should uh, should come forward uh, with, with uh, draft preliminary plans. Um, what I can tell you is that the Commission is in, in contact with all member states at this stage uh, for the preparations of the recovery plans and member states are at different stages um, as you may know some of the plans have already been announced publicly some others uh, not yet uh, but we are indeed in touch with uh, all member states at this stage uh, regarding the preparation indeed this process is meant to help uh, member states in the preparation of their plans according to the guidelines we have issued and in order to allow them to promptly present an official plan uh, uh, next year uh, when the legal basis is in force. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. We stay on questions related to uh, the economy uh, and I go to uh, Maria, Radio Nacional de España. Maria, press speech. To... Can you start over yes. again, please? We didn't hear the beginning. Yes, okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I think my question is for Marta. I would like to to know uh, about the mask VAT. If is is there any kind of European ban or any legal restriction to reduce uh, the mask VAT, or each country, like Spain in my case, uh, can decide by its own? Thank you. I don't think that's a question for Maria. That would be more a question for Dan because this is a taxation issue, so we, we note your question and we'll come back to it, um, we'll come back to it uh, later. Marta, I think that's correct, right? Not for yes, you. indeed, I think good. Dan will be better placed exactly. to answer, thank you. Very good, so we move to David. Yes, thank you. Uh, Marta, I would have a question on the um, recovery and resilience facility. Uh, I know that it's quite uh, technical, but it could be quite important too. Uh, it relates to uh, loans and how do you apply uh, rules on loans? Uh, because if I read uh, your proposal, I know that it's still under uh, consideration by the co-legislator, but if I read uh, your proposal, I understand that uh, uh, loans uh, uh, um, should be linked to new reforms and new investments, um, um, and mainly for uh, green and digital trans transitions. Uh, so my question is, uh, can a member state use loans to cover um, 
current expenditure, so the normal budget uh, and uh, all the programs, uh, or loans should be used for new investment and uh, uh, reforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I'll try to, to give you a bit of explanations about the, the loans part of the recovery and resilience facility. Um, so, as you know, first of all, loans, you know, do, do not depend on a specific allocation key, but uh, there is a specific cap um, for each member state that wish uh, to request loans. Um, I think what is important is to note that loans uh, to, are to be seen as complementary to the grants. And therefore, of course, if a member state wishes to take additional loans, um, the member state must justify by a need for additional financing because of you know the magnitude of reforms and, and investments to be to be undertaken um, and this obviously would have to be explained in the recovery and resilience plan to be uh, submitted uh, by by member states so uh, the loans are there to finance you know additional reforms and investments uh, in addition to those finance uh, by the grants uh, now when it comes to um, um, the actual use of those um, uh, grants and, and 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 loans, as you know, uh, they're not meant to to be necessarily financing recurring uh, recurring. Uh, expenditures, but rather, you know, to find specific investments and reforms uh, to be outlined in the recovery and resilience plans. Thank you, Marta. Um, Paola, I understand your question is on the issuance of bonds. As you know, there is a press conference on this tomorrow uh, by uh, Commissioner Hahn. So I would ask you to, uh, to address your question um, to, uh, to him during that, uh, during that press conference. Um, let's stick to the issue of the economy. Are there other questions for, uh, for Marta? Okay, Paula, you can ask, but we will probably send you to the, to the presser tomorrow, but go ahead. But to ask, you have to have the right source for your microphone. It does not seem to be working. So I will now go back to the other, other issues that were, uh, that were raised. Um, and I would like to go back to um, Nina, who had, Nima, sorry, Gadakpur, who had a question on Iran right at the beginning. Um, I don't know if you're still with us, Nima, but if you are, you have the floor now. I see you're still connected to the system, so don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask your question. Vous m'entendez, Eric? Je t'entends, absolument. Voilà. Ok, très bien. Et... Euh, <rire> non, mais je veux dire, euh, vu que là, maintenant, on est nombreux, c'est peut-être c'est mieux de séparer les gens qui ont des questions en dehors de l'Europe, parce que je vois que la priorité est toujours l'Europe, et c'est normal, en fait, c'est logique, euh, parce que moi, je travaille beaucoup avec euh, sur le Moyen-Orient, donc euh, bon, bref. Euh, bon, ma question est par rapport à euh, ce qui se passe en Iran euh, euh, en dehors de, de Covid et je pose ma question en anglais, peut-être que la réponse ça va être plus simple. Uh, the, the, the challenge facing Iranians uh, in recent days is uh, for actually for diabetic patients, it's the uh, shortage of insulin. So it, it's, a, it's a huge issue now in Iran. I talked with the witnesses yesterday uh, and I talked with the IDF, the, the International uh, Diabetic Federation, about the shortage of insulin, and they told me the main reason it's the USA sanctions. But the thing is, uh, all the insulins for diabetics is often supplied from Europe. It's actually Germans, Norwegian, whatever. So uh, my question is, uh, because a lot of people, actually a lot of NGOs asked me, asked Euronews yesterday, that uh, what's happening, how Europe can help actually, because it's, it's becoming really a, a big, big issue and people are dying. You know that if you have a diabetic kind of, the, the first diabetic and you can be, yeah, uh, 
I mean, lose your life. So uh, the question is, what we can do actually uh, via instincts? What's happening? Because uh, companies in Iran uh, telling that uh, importing drugs, it we can do it because European companies can do it because of American sanctions. So. Americans saying that we didn't uh, put sanctions on drugs and foods. So how, how does it possible to, yeah, I just need a comment. So thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your, for your question, um, Nima. Um, I, would, I wonder whether it is a question for Balash. Um, I will call him to the podium to see whether he can say what we have been doing in terms of aid uh, to Iran in this, um, in this area, um, or um, to Peter as well afterwards. But let's see first if we have something to say on humanitarian aid that we have brought to Iran in this field. Indeed, uh, this is a cross-cutting question, but let me add a few elements uh, from, the point of, uh, from the point of view of uh, civil protection and humanitarian uh, action. So as you know, what we have in this field is the civil protection uh, mechanism that can be activated by any countries around the world, including um, Iran. And in the context of the coronavirus in the past, you know, more than half a year, of course, the mechanism has been um, heavily uh, activated, including not only by EU member states, but, but also by uh, uh, third countries. And for this reason, uh, via the mechanism, we have channeled a significant amount of medical uh, material um, in general to a number of uh, third countries um, um, as, as well. So if I look at my, um, if I look at the figures that are in front of me, I think through the mechanism we have channeled aid to 22 non, um, non-EU member states on top of the help that was supplied within, within the EU in, in terms of medical uh, uh, material. So Iran is not an exception, of course. So um, just like any country, Iran can also activate the mechanism and indicate a need uh, for um, um, a medical material of, of any sort. We are ready always. We are always ready to examine uh, uh, such requests going forward. Thank you. So there is a humanitarian aid channel that uh, that can be activated. I think that that is the gist of the of the answer um, to your question with regards to Iran. Even if uh, even if up until now, uh, in the specific case of insulin, I do not think that there have been uh, any specific actions vis-à-vis -vis Iran. Uh, but let me also turn to Peter now for uh, any complementary elements you might have on this. Thank you. Good afternoon. Indeed, um, what Balas just explained is a very concrete proof of EU's um, commitment to help our partners outside, including Iran, to deal with the consequences of uh, Corona crisis. And the High Representative and the EU member states were also very clear that, uh, regardless of existing sanctions, be it the sanctions regime by the EU or uh, other unilateral sanctions imposed by other partners. Uh, these are not supposed to affect the humanitarian assistance. And uh, most recently, I would like to direct your attention to the fact that the Commission actually adopted the guidance uh, for everyone uh, in order to clarify how it is possible to provide humanitarian assistance uh, also to countries which are under sanctioned regimes. Because one thing is clear, the sanctions especially those imposed by the EU, are not supposed to affect the humanitarian assistance. And this is what we are doing. So clarifying this also with, the, with our partners, with the organizations, NGOs, uh, private companies, and then being co committed to find ways how to proceed with offering and providing humanitarian assistance to those who need it most. In this case, it's the Iranian people. Thank you very much. Do we have other foreign uh, relations related question today. Please keep your hand raised only if that is the case. Uh, I know that there are other questions huh, still that we will come back to later on, but uh, therefore I move to Athanasios. Uh, so, did the European Commission uh, receive a letter from the Foreign Affairs Minister of Greece, Nikos Dendrigas, about the customs union that could potentially be suspended, the customs union uh, with Turkey, I mean. Uh, could you please tell us what uh, does this letter say and how could you answer on it? Uh, is it? Is there, a, let's say, a legal possibility to suspend temporarily maybe the customs union for, uh, for a member of, this, uh, of this, um, this facility? Is it even possible? Thank you. 
I'm not quite sure um, whom the letter was addressed to specifically. Let me turn back to Peter to see if he has any elements on this. Well, indeed, one of the addressee of the letter by the Foreign Minister of Greece was also high representative, but the letter which we just received a short while ago is not dealing with the customs union. I understand this is something that was addressed to Commissioner Varheli, and therefore it's uh, for Anna to maybe say something more on this. So, Anna, can you confirm receipt of the letter? Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Hel Okay, thanks so much. So, um, thanks, Anastasios, for the question. We can indeed confirm that we have just received uh, the letter for uh, from the Greek uh, Foreign Minister, Mr. Dendias, to uh, Commissioner Varheli. Um, a letter um, has also been sent, a copy of the letter has also been sent to Executive Vice President, uh, Mr. Dombrovskis. Um, from the Commission side, um, what we can say at this stage is that we take note, of course, of the letter, including its call for legal action under the Customs Union and considering a broader uh, suspension of the agreement. Um, we will duly, uh, duly uh, analyze it and uh, we will reply in due course after, after we do this uh, duly analysis of it. You have a follow-up, Patanasios. Yes, that's right. I have a follow-up. Uh, if I heard correctly, Peter said that there is another letter from the Foreign Affairs Minister of Greece uh, for the uh, higher representative. So what kind of letter is that and what does it say? Thanks. That is really good. Peter, go ahead. Well, um, you've seen you've seen the media reports and questions from your colleagues uh, asking about uh, different letters being sent to different addresses. As I said, one of them was high representative. But uh, since we just received the letter and more generally, it is not our habit to comment or disclose the content of the communication that is addressed to the HRVP. So I can only I can only recall that uh, we will we will pay due attention to the letter, take it into due consideration and then uh, act and reply accordingly. Sorry. Sorry for that, Atanasios. Um, but perhaps uh, our, the Greeks, the Greek government, will be able to help you um, a bit on on that. Um, okay. Are there other foreign relations related questions? I do not see any. So I now go back to Maria, who had a question on VAT and masks in Spain for Dan, if I remember well. Ah, sorry, Maria, you have a follow-up on Turkey. Apologies, I had not seen. Sorry. Maria. So, a uh, follow-up. Yes, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, apologies. I had not can seen you your see? hand raised. Yeah, go ahead. I was wondering what, what happened, and you don't see my question, Eric, but it's a follow-up on the letter sent to Commissioner Vaheli. Um, two questions, actually. What exactly is Greece asking, if we may know? And was there a meeting of the Common Committee today that was cancelled? Something was cancelled today because of this letter, because that's uh, what um, the Cypriot newspapers report. And I don't know if it is uh, true or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. We go back to Anna. Hi, do you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Yeah. So concerning your first question, uh, Maria, thanks so much. Um, you know, we've gone as far as um, as uh, we can go. Um, as Peter rightly said, we are, we don't usually, uh, you know, go into the content of these letters. These are private letters that are addressed uh, be between interlocutors. So again, as Eric also pointed out, um, you could maybe check with the Greek government if they want to uh, make uh, more information available at this stage. Uh, we've gone as far as we could go there. And as regards to your second question, I'm not um, I'm not too sure what you're referring to, but um, I could probably just recall that, um, as you know, um, high-level meetings between the EU and Turkey um, are, are on pause uh, due to uh, Turkey's actions. Um, so I, I don't know if this is what you are referring to. Thank you. Maria, you have a follow-up. Sorry to, to understand correctly. Uh, the Common Committee uh, for the Custom Union between EU and Turkey is high level committee or not? Anna.
Hello? Yes. Go ahead. I understand. I understand that no, that the uh, the, the uh, committee, um, uh, the joint committee on EU customs uh, union, um, is not the high level meeting. It's not like the EU high level dialogues that we have, for example, in economy or in energy with Turkey. Um, these indeed are technical talks, and I have uh, I have uh, no information on the, on on a meeting taking place. Um, I'm happy to check and get back to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions on this uh, issue? Atanasio, you have another question on this issue. Please, shortly, because we have lots of other issues to go through still. Yeah, I can imagine. Personal things still. The Greek foreign ministry sent a letter to Heiko Mas on arms embargo against Turkey. Could, could you please ask Peter to remind us What's on the table right now about the arms embargo decided on the 13th of October 2019 against Turkey on the case of Syria? Thanks. Peter. Well, on, on, on the letter you mentioned, uh, again, this is bilateral issue, so it would be best to ask either the Greek sender or the German uh, recipient. On the arms embargo, you, um, you are referring to the um, embargo introduced last year. I mean, it's still on the table. You've seen the discussions at the European Council last uh, Friday, last Thursday, last Friday, also uh, taking into account uh, the developments regarding the relations between Turkey, Greece and Cyprus. Uh, no new decisions have been uh, have been taken. The conclusions are very clear what we expect in general uh, from, from Turkey. So the discussions are still ongoing, of course, among the member states and the letters sent by the Greek foreign minister are just um, another example of it, that the discussion continues. But uh, at this stage, there is no new initiative, no new decision, um, as, as um, outlined in the Council conclusions from last Friday. Thank you very much. I think this uh, closes our foreign affairs chapter. Let me see whether uh, Maria Caru is still with us, because she had a question on VAT for masks. Yes, go ahead. Maria, you have the floor. Um, yes, okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead, yeah. Okay. I would like to know if uh, is there any kind of European ban or any legal restriction uh, to reduce the mask VAT or if each country, like Spain in this case, can decide by its own? Thank you. Thank you. That is a question for Dan. There is, in fact, a whole VAT framework in place in the European Union, uh, depending on the types of products, but I let Dan give you the details. Hi, Eric, and hi, Maria. Indeed, there is quite a wide um, set of rules in this area, uh, particularly also in, in the COVID context. Now, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to double check a number of things before giving you the full, complete picture on this. So I'd like to get back to you um, early afternoon, if that's okay with you. Thank you very much. Are there other questions for Dan? And my instinct tells me that I should now go to James. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, yes, your instinct's correct. I'm wondering, Dan, if you have any reaction to the British reaction to Michelle Barnier's tweet yesterday. Uh, basically, uh, Britain wants Michel Barnier to say the EU has to move as well as the UK in order to get a deal. And it's pretty lame, but that's where we are at the moment. So um, what's the next uh, sort of turn in this um, increasingly tedious charade? <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, Hi James. Um, so you, you'll be aware that Michel Barnier spoke to David Frost yesterday afternoon. You will have seen his tweet in which he confirmed that the EU is ready, is willing to intensify discussions with the UK on all topics and on the basis of legal text. So that's the context in which we are. Um, you know, of course, that we're going to remain in contact with the UK. Uh, Michel Barnier will speak to David Frost later this afternoon. Um, so that's all I would have to say right now. Now, I would be very happy to give you a readout after the phone call this afternoon. We stay ready to negotiate. On this, James, you have a follow-up. 
Yes, it's a very quick follow-up. Um, will both sides, both the UK and the EU, have to compromise in order for there to be a successful deal? James, um, I mean, this is a question uh, 101 for students in international negotiations. Um, and therefore, uh, I think it is pretty obvious that um, in order to come to an agreement, both sides um, need to meet. Um, and uh, this is also obviously the case in this, uh, in this negotiation. Joe, is it a question on Brexit? If so, go ahead. It is, in, it is indeed, Eric. Thank you. Um, so going on to uh, the appeal, the council announced a five billion adjustment fund, I believe it was called, um, but then left it up, up to the commission to basically come up with how the money is spent. Um, and given that Boris Johnson has kind of decided that he wants to ramp up or whatever we want to use terms wise, his no deal preparations, I just want to wonder how the commission's no deal preparations are going. Um, have we got any clearer picture when the how the money will be spent? Um, then also things like um, aviation and road transport. Previously, we've had contingency measures, unilateral contingency measures. Um, is it just a case of reviving the former kind of regulations um, used in the withdrawal phase um, and then having them updated to kind of reflect the current situation? Um, so just to update on where we stand there, please. Sorry, Dan, thank you. Thank you. I believe this is a question for, for Balash. And then on contingency measures for Dan. Balash on the budget issue. Indeed. So the Brexit Adjustment Fund um, is part of the negotiations on the MFF and Next Generation EU, which are ongoing at the present moment. So I'm not going to be able to give you details on how the uh, fund um, will be spent or utilized once it's been agreed upon. So uh, to give you a bit of an insight into the process, which I have had the opportunity to, to do a few times uh, in the recent weeks on the podium. So we, have, we are having trilateral meetings involving the Parliament, the Council and the Commission. Since the end of August, we have had uh, eight uh, trilateral meetings and the next one is uh, scheduled for uh, Wednesday, so uh, for tomorrow. Um, and of course, as I have said many times from the Commission side, we are there to uh, try and, and um, get the parties to work towards a uh, compromise as soon as possible, um, given the urgencies that, that we are facing in this context. Dan, on contingency measures. Yep. Hi, Eric, and hi, Joe. As I said, we are committed and willing to, to intensify the negotiations with the UK. The only basis for us is the council mandate that was given to us earlier this year that foresees a, a comprehensive new partnership with the UK. Uh, as you know, there are only a few weeks left, and that is what we are concentrating all of our efforts on right now. Generally speaking, though, I would just point out that we're in a very different situation to the one that we were in in 2019. All stakeholders have now had a lot of time to prepare. And I'd also just point out that the withdrawal agreement is in force. And the withdrawal agreement, as I'm sure you know, protects citizens' rights, uh, the EU's financial interests, uh, peace and stability on the island of Ireland, amongst many other things. Joe, you have a follow-up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, please. Um, on the having time for stakeholders to prepare question, have you done any kind of ring round studies, surveys with businesses to ask how many have prepared? Because um, the British government, uh, not to compare, but they announced that they think two thirds of businesses aren't ready um, for the end of transition period, come what may, whether there be a deal or not. And that there is still a large majority of businesses that believe a transition period will still continue into next year. So just an update on where kind of you believe the EU preparedness is of stakeholders on this side of the channel, please. Dan. Dan. Joe, we have been preparing ourselves and EU stakeholders for a number of years now. Um, you would have seen everything that we have published over the past four years. We are in constant contact with uh, all member states, administrations and stakeholders. Um, so we are prepared for, for the end of the transition period. I would just point out as well that there are a number of changes that will happen in any event, whether there is a deal or, or not. And uh, in that context, you will remember the communication that we put forward during the summer on that. 
thank you very much. I only see one more hand raised at this uh, stage. No, now I see some others, um, but we will close the Brexit uh, chapter and move on to other issues. Thank you, Balash. Uh, Marco, you have the floor. Oui, bonjour, merci, Eric. Uh, je voulais savoir si la présidente de la Commission européenne est toujours en uh, auto-isolement et jusqu'à quand elle uh, y restera. Et si, eh, donc, pendant cette journée, ces eh, réunions avec les commissaires sont toujours euh, d'une modalité virtuelle et pas physique. Et plus en général, je voudrais savoir si vous avez adopté des mesures supplémentaires pour les, les fonctionnaires et les membres du cabinet, des, des, des cabinets de la Commission, vu que la Belgique, il y a trois jours, a, a recommandé que le télétravail devrait être la règle et pas l'exception. Merci. Merci, Marco, pour ces questions. En ce qui concerne la présidente, elle se trouve effectivement encore euh, en, en isolement euh, préventif. Euh, et euh, je ne peux pas te dire exactement à quel moment elle compte revenir euh, sur, euh, sur Bruxelles. Nous ne communiquons pas sur, euh, sur son calendrier exact de, de déplacement. Tu comprendras pourquoi mais bien entendu, elle travaille. Elle a dirigé une première réunion du groupe des commissaires, plus particulièrement concerné par la lutte contre le Covid, hier matin par vidéoconférence, comme tu as pu le voir. Puis elle a présidé le collège aussi de manière, de manière virtuelle. Elle a une vidéoconférence, comme je l'ai annoncé au début du rendez-vous de midi, avec le Premier ministre italien, M. Conte, je crois en ce moment même, si je ne m'abuse. Si euh, et donc, effectivement, euh, elle, travaille, euh, elle travaille de manière, euh, de manière euh, réelle, même si c'est en utilisant des réseaux virtuels. Voilà. En ce qui concerne les mesures, euh, Marco, nous avons ici eu amplement l'occasion de décrire toutes les différentes mesures qui ont été prises pour protéger les membres du personnel, pas simplement les membres des, euh, les membres des cabinets, mais... Parmi les dernières mesures que nous avons pu euh, annoncer, euh, il y avait le fait que, euh, effectivement, les réunions, de, euh, les réunions spéciales de chefs de cabinet, comme on les appelle, qui réunissent euh, les membres de cabinet sur un dossier particulier, se tiennent dorénavant de manière virtuelle, et que la, euh, que la participation à la réunion hebdomadaire des chefs de cabinet a été restreinte et qu'elle se fait avec euh, euh, le port obligatoire du masque. Euh, de même, la participation aux réunions du collège a été restreinte euh, en salle et les commissaires euh, portent, les membres du collège portent euh, aussi un masque tout au long de la réunion, sauf quand ils sont en train de, euh, de parler. Une mesure qui a été prise, qui découle directement des décisions très récentes de la Belgique, c'est que euh, les, les cantines de la commission, les rares cantines qui étaient ouvertes, euh, sont maintenant de nouveau, euh, de nouveau fermées, ce qui ne facilite pas toujours euh, la vie. Euh, et par ailleurs, effectivement, le personnel est encouragé à rester en télétravail. Il y a euh, un certain nombre de personnels critiques qui viennent en, euh, physiquement au bureau. C'est le cas pour euh, les collègues du service du porte-parole, même si nous avons un système de rotation. Et euh, tu auras peut-être vu des images euh, de la salle. Ils, tous mes collègues portent le masque ici en salle, en, en salle de presse. Donc je pense que la Commission européenne prend toutes les mesures qu'elle peut afin euh, d'assurer euh, la sécurité euh, de, ses, euh, de ses personnels, de s'adapter aux mesures qui sont prises par les autorités euh, nationales. Cela a bien entendu et malheureusement un impact aussi sur notre travail. Nous continuons à devoir tenir cette... Euh, ce, ce midday briefing, ce rendez-vous quotidien avec vous euh, euh, par le biais de notre, inter, de notre application, donc de manière euh, virtuelle. Et il est clair que pour le moment, euh, nous ne pouvons pas vraiment envisager de changer de, euh, de paradigme. Voilà. David, je te repasse la parole. Oui, Eric, euh, juste une précision. Enfin, j'ai une précision à te demander et une question, et peut-être un follow-up après. Euh, la présidente, donc, n'est pas en, à Bruxelles en ce moment. C'est ce que tu, tu, tu et, nous as dit. Écoute, David, euh, je n'ai bien ça. l'intention de te, de, te, de te dire exactement où elle est. Elle est simplement en isolement. Voilà. Et, euh, 
et elle n'est pas au bureau. Reste. Oui, alors, je, je, euh, euh, tu, tu as dit qu'elle euh, n'est pas retournée à Bruxelles, donc mm. je, je voudrais savoir si la présidente est à Bruxelles. Alors, euh, je, je, je crois que dire, elle n'est pas à Bruxelles. Voilà, mais pour des questions Très bien. De, alors, de sécurité, alors, de vie privée, ma, ma question... Oui, 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 absolument, absolument. Mais il y a des questions de sécurité, de vie privée qui sont assez intéressantes parce qu'un euh, commissaire a donné ses démissions parce qu'il a violé les règles de confinement et la présidence a abandonné la réunion du Conseil européen euh, jeudi euh, vers 5 euh, heures et elle était à Bruxelles, euh, théoriquement pour se mettre en, en isolement. Alors je, je voulais savoir... Euh, 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 si elle a respecté toutes tout les règles prévues pour euh, euh, l'isolement. Euh, et, euh, euh, et voilà, je, je crois que c'est la, la, la question. Et deuxième question, euh, vu que la Belgique a changé, euh, 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 vu que la Belgique a changé euh, les paramètres pour euh, les tests, l'isolement, etc., si... Euh, euh, elle n'est pas en, en Belgique. Euh, Est-ce qu'elle euh, va faire un test Est-ce que vous avez un accès, euh, comment dire, une capacité autonome de test à la Commission En ce moment, en Belgique, on a décidé de tester seulement les symptomatiques et pas les asymptomatiques. Et donc, ça a des conséquences pour les gens qui rentrent des pays étrangers. Est-ce qu'elle va se remettre en, en, en quarantaine euh, et cela vaut aussi pour les commissaires. S'ils rentrent en Belgique, je veux dire comment ça va marcher. Merci. Merci. Tu peux bien t'imaginer, David, que si la présidente a pris la décision de quitter le Conseil européen euh, pour se mettre en isolement préventif, euh, c'est bien entendu pour justement respecter euh, euh, tous les protocoles euh, et pouvoir s'assurer euh, qu'elle euh, ne puisse pas représenter... Euh, un risque et donc effectivement c'est euh, ce qui s'est passé. En ce qui concerne, euh, en ce qui concerne la, la capacité euh, de test de la, de, la, de la commission, je passe la parole à Balash qui va te fournir les détails. Oui, bonjour David. Donc euh, un commentaire bref euh, sur cette question spécifique. Donc effectivement, euh, au service médical euh, de la Commission, en ce moment, il existe une capacité limitée euh, pour faire des tests. Donc euh, pour l'instant, on, on réserve cette capacité pour euh, le personnel critique euh, de la Commission européenne. Voilà. Merci. Euh, Marco, you have a question. You no longer have a question. Yes. Oui. Oui, vas-y. Oui, c'est en fait un, un follow-up. Euh, donc, si j'ai bien compris, la présidente de la Commission, jeudi, elle a quitté le Conseil européen parce qu'elle a su d'avoir été en contact avec quelqu'un testé positif. Et après, elle a quitté la Belgique, c'est ça J'ai dit, Marco, que je ne donnerai pas de, de précision sur l'endroit exact où elle se trouve. Elle a quitté le Conseil européen. Euh, pour se mettre en isolement préventif, bien qu'elle-même ait, ait été testée le matin même négative. Mais effectivement, étant donné qu'elle avait été en contact avec euh, quelqu'un euh, qui a été testé le même jour positif, euh, il a été euh, considéré judicieux qu'elle se place en, euh, en isolement préventif, absolument. Ce qui n'est pas une quarantaine, elle est donc en isolement préventif, euh, euh, ça n'est donc pas exactement le même, euh, le même concept. Marco, tu as un follow-up Je t'en prie. Oui, euh, oui, merci. Euh, non, effectivement, je ne veux pas savoir exactement dans quelle maison, bâtiment elle se trouve. Je voulais juste savoir si... Euh, vu qu'elle a été en contact avec quelqu'un positif, elle a quitté la Belgique, ou si elle est toujours dans, dans ce pays, comme est prévu par les règles, parce que je crois que selon les règles, il faut se mettre en isolement préventif, selon les règles de la Belgique, et on ne peut pas 
euh, quitter le pays. Mais peut-être que je me trompe. Merci. Euh, je ne... Non, non, je ne, pense pas que ce soit le... je ne pense pas que ce soit le cas. Et euh, j'ai dit qu'effectivement, elle avait quitté, euh, qu'elle avait quitté euh, Bruxelles pour se mettre en, pour se mettre en isolement. Euh, ce n'est pas du tout évident de se mettre en isolement euh, au, sein, euh, au, sein du, au sein du Berlaymont avec tout le personnel qui, euh, qui travaille euh, à, à l'étage euh, où, elle a ses, où elle a son logement et ses, et ses bureaux. Donc, euh, elle, n'est plus à, elle n'est plus à Bruxelles, effectivement. David. Oui, excuse-moi, c'est, j'insiste. Elle est en Belgique ou elle n'est pas en Belgique <rire> J'ai déjà répondu à cette question. J'ai dit que je ne donnerai pas plus de précisions que celles que j'ai déjà, euh, que que j'ai déjà euh, données pour le, pour le moment. Y a-t-il d'autres questions pour nous aujourd'hui Lorne. Go ahead. Yes, Lorne Cook, Associated Press. Uh, thanks, Eric, for your patience and, should I say, perhaps your stamina. Um, I have a question which I think is a, a migration issue concerning uh, Libya. Uh, at the weekend, Libyan security forces said they'd arrested one of the country's most wanted uh, human traffickers. And this gentleman uh, also happened to be a commander of a unit in the, the Coast Guard, which, as we know, was uh, financed by the uh, European Union. Um, I'm interested in what reaction you might have to this uh, arrest and also uh, the fact that over several years now and including just recently senior European officials have spoken about the need to break the business model uh, of the smugglers and whether whether there's any regret that European uh, money is being used and is it perhaps time you know, to actually fund this business model uh, and is it time to rethink uh, the way that money is used as uh, far as it concerns the Libyan Coast Guard? Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure whether the question is for Adalbert or for Peter. Let me turn first to Adalbert. Uh, hi, Eric. Um, I- I think it's more of a uh, more of a foreign, uh, not so much foreign affairs, but um, uh, kind of f- financing and DG near question from as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I can maybe just uh, recall that um, our objective in terms of uh, any cooperation with the with the Libyan Coast Guard is uh, purely one of uh, making sure that there is capacity in the Mediterranean to save lives. And um, the uh, we, we apply very strict uh, rules as to how exactly we engage with uh, with the Libyan Coast Guard, and, and um, if if needed, we we would be very happy to give you uh, full details on that. Okay, let me see if Anna has anything to add on this. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks so much. Um, So, Lauren, what I can tell you is that, I mean, we have um, a big package of support uh, for Libya. Um, You know, we have projects ongoing in Libya for 700, over around 700 uh, million euros uh, from 2014 and 2020. And this is using several of our different instruments. Um, You know that um, most of the funding is actually coming from um, the uh, UTF, the uh, European Union Trust Fund for Africa. so this is about 455 uh, million euros. Um, what we can say is that you know uh, uh, more than half of this funding um, is actually going for uh, protection of migrants and refugees, and about uh, one third is going for um, community stabilization programs. Um, we do have also, uh, of course, a program on border management, which um, is the one that you're more specifically uh, referring to. And um, here, what uh, we can say is that, of course, the main aim of this uh, management program is, of course, to save lives, as uh, very well um, our colleague uh, Adalbert uh, has said. And um, the main beneficiaries of these uh, programs are actually the um, the Libyan General Administration for Coastal uh, Security, which, as you know, is the force that is under the competence of the Interior Ministry uh, of Libya and whose uh, area of operations is uh, limited uh, to the 12 nautical uh, mile zone. 
Um, the second beneficiary is uh, are the Libyan Coast Guards, which are, uh, of course, under the competence of the uh, of the Ministry of Defence. Um, I mean, if you're a bit more interested to know um, what we have actually uh, done so far in the framework of this uh, programme, um, as you very well know, we've had a series of technical trainings that have been provided to 83 members of the General Administration for Coastal Service, uh, Security uh, on issues like navigation skills uh, for ship management, but also, uh, you know, uh, human rights uh, uh, issues. Um, we've also delivered delivered um, certain um, uh, vehicles uh, for the uh, Libyan uh, authorities. And uh, most recently as well, we've delivered um, two vessels that were actually belonging uh, to the uh, GACs um, that have been rehabilitated under uh, the uh, EUTF uh, Trust Fund. Um, and the rehabilitation, as you know, um, has been implemented by the uh, Italian Ministry of Interior. So I think I'll stop there. I was quite um, long. Sorry for this. No, no, Anna, we try to give information. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see um, lots of comments um, in the comment function on this, on, the, on, this, on, the, uh, on my answers related to the president. Let me make one thing abundantly clear. According to um, the, uh, the protocols that are in place, the president had no obligation to, uh, to go into self-isolation. She had not been in contact for the requisite period of time uh, at a small distance without a mask, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, at any moment that would have uh, obliged her to take this step. It was decided consciously that, nevertheless, um, she would go into self-isolation so as to not take any uh, risk uh, whatsoever. I remind you that she was in the context of the, of the uh, European Council. And um, uh, what I can say is that uh, indeed she is in, um, in Germany at this point in time and uh, we will see when she comes back to, uh, to uh, Belgium. But let me repeat, she is not in quarantine as uh, some of you are saying according to, uh, to uh, the protocols Belgium, she is in self-isolation, which is a voluntary measure which she took uh, in order not uh, to take any risks. Okay. Right. I think that this concludes our midday briefing today, which was a rather long one, but uh, we did not have uh, any midday press briefings now for um, a couple of days, so I think it was well worth it. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, see you tomorrow because since the college took place uh, yesterday, tomorrow we will have a normal midday briefing. Bon appétit et à demain.